I am the marketing officer with the Faculty of Social Sciences, and I will be your moderator for today. I would like to welcome everybody to our seminar as um, you all come in. Um, I would like to send welcome to our Dean, Dr. Heather Ricketts, who is with us, as well as our former Dean, Prof. David Tennant. Thank you guys for coming on to our seminar. We would also like to send welcome and greetings to our interim chair for the grant writing committee, um, Dr. Delroy Chavos. So just welcoming you all in. Today's session will give us an overview of the newest kid on the block, chat GPT, and how we can leverage in a healthy way um, this AI assistant tool for research and grant writing. Now, I'm going to stop the video. I'm going to do an introductory presentation um, just to give um, some context and some basis for the main presentation that will um, be done by Miss Nicole McKenzie. So, First, we're going to start out with a disclaimer. Now, ChatGPT is a very new digital tool that we are all getting to know and understand just as anybody else. So the information that we're providing today, we hope will foster discussion, spark ideas on how to use this AI tool within the educational and research space. Now, we are no way, in no way experts on ChatGPT. But we think we can work together to find ways to leverage the positive elements of the platform to enhance our various research outputs. All right, so slide one. Introduction. So now ChatGPT can be a useful tool for research and research grant proposals. It helps with things like ideating research topics, refining the content within a body of work, and it also gives you feedback. Think of it as having a chat with an entity that can quickly pull on information from all corners of the internet. This comes with limitations, of course, which will briefly be touched on um, in the main presentation. Now, how can we use ChatGPT for research? One of the first things that we can use it for is for, uh, we can use it for brainstorming and ideating, essentially idea generation. So we can engage in a conversation with ChatGPT to brainstorm research topics, explore different research angles, or generate new ideas. So you can describe your research area of interest or research question and ask it to suggest insights and useful information on that topic. ChatGPT can provide alternative perspectives and help you think um, creatively. The second thing is that it can also help with your um, literature review. And specifically, ChatGPT can assist in conducting a preliminary literature review by summarizing key findings from relevant research papers or articles. You can um, provide ChatGPT with specific research topics, keywords, or questions, and it can suggest and provide you with brief summaries and highlight important concepts or even suggest additional resources. It can also assist with data analysis. If you have collected research data and need assistance with analysis, you can discuss your data set and analyze goals with ChatGPT. Although ChatGPT does not have direct access to external databases, it can provide general guidance, explain statistical methods, or suggest potential analysis approaches based on the information you provide. It also can assist with writing. So ChatGPT can work as a writing assistant for your research papers, grant proposals, or manuscripts. 
discuss the structure of your paper, organization, and content of your document, and seek suggestions from ChatGPT for improving clarity, coherence, and overall quality. ChatGPT can also help with grammar, language refinement, and proofreading. Fact-checking and verification. ChatGPT can assist in fact-checking specific information or verifying claims. You can ask it to validate facts, provide definitions, or check the accuracy and statements based on available knowledge. Now, remember that while ChatGPT can be a helpful tool in research, it is not a substitute for domain expertise or rigorous scientific methods. Always critically evaluate the information provided by ChatGPT and consult with human experts or trusted sources to ensure the validity and reliability of your research outputs. Um, so now we're gonna speak to how we can use it for grant writing. Um, similarly, we can use it for brainstorming. Um, so we can engage in a conversation with ChatGPT to explore different angles, approaches, and innovative ideas for your grant proposal. Describe your project, the objectives and desired outcomes, and ask ChatGPT for suggestions and insights. It can provide you with alternative perspectives and potentially uncover new possibilities. Then it can assist with outlining and structuring your proposal. So you would want to break down your grant proposal into sections such as introduction, goals, methodology, budget, and evaluation. You can consult with ChatGP to discuss the structure and organization of each section, ask for recommendations on how to best present your ideas and arguments, and make them clear, logical, and persuasive. Then it also assists with crafting compelling narratives. Grant proposals often require a compelling story to engage the reader and convey the importance of the project. Collaborate with ChatGPT to refine your narrative. Ensure that it communicates the significance, impact, and relevance of your project. Discuss different approaches, storytelling techniques, and strategies to create a persuasive proposal. As mentioned before, it also assists with language refinement. So we can use ChatGPT to refine the language, grammar, and style of your grant proposal. It can help you avoid common writing errors, suggest improvements to sentence structure, and provide voc vocabulary suggestions to enhance the clarity and coherency of your writing. Additionally, you can use ChatGPT to proofread and edit your proposal for typos and grammatical mistakes. And then it can also review and give you feedback. So after drafting your proposal, engage, engage with ChatGPT to review and receive feedback. Discuss the strengths and weaknesses of your proposal and seek suggestions for improvement and identify any gaps or errors that require further clarification. ChatGPT can also provide an objective analysis and point out potential errors for improvement. Remember, and the disclaimer again, that while ChatGPT can be a valuable tool, it should not replace expertise and critical thinking of a grant writer. It is crucial to seek feedback from a human expert, such as mentors or colleagues who can provide domain specific knowledge and insight to ensure the quality and effectiveness of your grant proposal. And this is a pullout from um, a document that was circulated on Mona Messaging um, by UNESCO. And it all just gives you an overview of the possibilities um, that can be had with um, chat GPT and research. And this essentially just pulls everything that was just mentioned together in a neat little graphic um, that basically speaks to generating ideas, um, data analysis, data collection, and um, methodologies around data collection. It can assist with that and assist with improving writing quality. Now, 
thank you guys so much. And I hope this introductory presentation has sparked some ideas around how you could use ChatGPT to help with your research. As we move into these summer months, which some of us use and dedicate to research. Now, our next presenter will go through a more technical, the more technical elements of ChatGPT and give us an idea of how to set up an account and some best practices when using this AI assistant. Our next presenter is Miss Nicole McKenzie. And she is the IT officer with the Faculty of Social Sciences and the Faculty of Law. Nicole started her IT career as a computer lab technician and advanced information technologist at the UA, where she currently holds a post of IT officer. Nicole is passionate about game changing and disruptive technologies, specifically blockchain and AI. She is fascinated by the potential of these technologies and their transformative impact. So without further ado, we will hand it over to Ms. Nicole McKenzie for the main presentation. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you all for joining me today. I will be delivering a presentation that provides a brief explanation of what ChatGPT, the free version, is, and the rest of my presentation will serve to guide you through the basic steps of integrating ChatGPT into your personal research endeavors. So everybody can see the screen. I'm hoping all of that is clear. Yes? Great. All right. So during this workshop session, we will explore some effective steps to utilizing this powerful tool to help you start off your own research journey. And to close out our session, I will also highlight some of the warnings and limitations with the use of this AI and to point out its evolution process. So what is ChatGPT? ChatGPT is an artificial intelligence language processing model created by OpenAI, an AI research and deployment company. It is a powerful tool that generates human-like responses to text-based inputs, and it can be used for a variety of purposes. For example, answering questions on numerous topics, providing explanations, offering suggestions, engaging in dialogue, as well as generating text in a conversational manner, making it well-suited for chat-based applications. The model is trained on vast amounts of text data from the internet, allowing it to learn patterns, grammar, and context in language. OpenAI has made efforts to make ChatGPT more useful, safe, and reliable by implementing various techniques, including reinforcement learning from human feedback and a, moder and, and a moderation system to filter out inappropriate or harmful content. It's important to note that as an AI language model, ChatGPT is not a conscious being and does not possess real world knowledge or personal experiences beyond what it has been trained on. It responses are generated based on patterns and examples it has learned during training and it does not have an inherent understanding of the world or an ability to think critically. So in order to gain access to use ChatGPT, you first have to log in. You, if you do not have an account, you need to sign up and create one. So on the screen, we have what that should look like. And for account creation, you'll be presented with multiple options such as using Microsoft, Google, or Apple accounts to sign in. And then you choose the one that suits you best. Throughout the sign up process, you'll be prompted to do a few things like verify your email, prove that you're a human, and also provide a cellular number that an activation slash authorization code will be sent to in order for you to successfully complete your account creation process. After successful login or account creation, 
chat.openai.com brings you to the message prompt where you can now engage with ChatGPT directly. OpenAI also lists a few examples along with a few of the artificial intelligence capabilities and some of the key limitations of using ChatGPT. Now that we're logged in, let's highlight some of the possible uses for research to get you inspired. Here is a short list of what ChatGPT can do for you. First, it can do information retrieval. Second, it can do literature reviews. Third, it can also do idea generation. Fourth, data analysis and visualization. Fifth, language translation. Sixth, proofreading and editing. Seventh, citation and reference management. Eighth, experimental design. Ninth, survey design and analysis. Tenth, collaborative research. And the list can go on. It has many, many more uses. However, as I had said in my introduction, my focus today is to just demonstrate basic steps on how to more effectively use it for research. In order to get the most out of ChatGPT, the foundation starts with asking the right questions or making the right statements using what I would define as a more specific statement or querying style. How exactly do you ask the right questions or make the right statements? You would do this through the use of prompts. What is a prompt? A prompt is basically just a question or a statement entered into ChatGPT as text-based input. If you want great results from ChatGPT, some pre-thought has to go into the designing of the types of statements or questions you need to ask. So you would do two things. One is called prompt engineering and the other prompt optimization. The idea behind using prompt engineering and prompt optimization methods is that this process should get you to design as detailed as possible an instruction or a discussion topic. User user would provide this for ChatGPT to respond conversationally to. So let me break down prompt engineering and prompt optimization some more. The best formula is to use the five W's and H approach. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. Here are a few examples of the methodology. With using who, tell ChatGPT who is your expected target audience. Example, a six-year-old or a beginner, a novice or an educator, etc. With using what, state the specific question you need to have ChatGPT answer. For using when, state the timelines or any limitations such as much, setting much as, as much as possible, setting your necessary parameters where possible. With using where, state if you want this information to be from online sources or ask how to find possible offline sources. When using why, tell the AI the purpose for which it should provide this information. And finally, when using how, tell the AI what role it should adopt or personify. Adopting this approach will go a long way to improving the generated responses that you can receive from ChatGPT. You can enter these prompts line by line, or you can bundle them as a complete paragraph. The AI can handle either way. Let me walk you through an example. We want to get a list of research topics in the subject area of Caribbean labor economics. If you just want a quick general answer with no specifics, you can go ahead and tell ChatGPT via prompt to just generate a list of research topics for Caribbean labor economics. You will be provided with a very generic answer like the one shown on the image on the right, which doesn't go into very much detail. Or, we can get a more detailed response. We can follow the five W and H approach 
and get a very detailed answer. In order to do this, we would create the following type of question instead. Our question would now be, using the role of an expert economist, generate a list of three research topics for labor economics in the Caribbean. Also provide at least two links to relevant peer-reviewed online articles written between 2006 and 2019 for each of the three topic areas you suggest. Give your justification for choosing those online articles. This example was written to demonstrate the use of a prompt as a paragraph. I will now highlight the use of the five Ws. In the first sentence, we have the who, the what, and the where. The who is using the role of an expert economist, generate a list of the what, three research topics for labor economics, the where in the Caribbean. In the second sentence, we outline our necessary parameters as well as the when. So our necessary parameters also provide at least two links relevant peer review online articles and the when written between 2006 to 2019 for each of the three topic areas you suggest. And in your final sentence, we provide the why. Give your justification for choosing these online articles. Here is a further breakdown of the five W's and H approach. Without properly formulated prompts or structured questions, you can get a generic in, generic out experience or not very useful or inaccurate responses from ChatGPT. Since ChatGPT works with massive text-based data sets, it's best to guide the AI to fine tune this data using a layered prompt approach. Basically, start from the generic subject matter to pull into ChatGPT the largest relevant data set, then fine tune with more precise follow-up questions slash statements to polish up the generated results. This will tend to produce clear-cut responses to search prompts after particular layers of data sets were examined by ChatGPT. And just as a warning, the AI is not a substitute for human expertise, verification, and judgment. ChatGPT can also be used more broadly than for research purposes. It can help you find errors in grammar for emails, essays, or it can help you write or optimize computer programming code, as it will also suggest edits and provide sample answers. So it's a very powerful tool. Here is a second example, still using the five Ws and H approach, but using the line by line style instead of the paragraph one to get a template in grant writing generated. I typed in the following prompt. Using expert knowledge in research grant writing, create a 10-step grant proposal template. The AI listed 10 good steps I could take towards creating a grant proposal template. These were the executive summary, introduction and background, objectives and research, etc., all the way to step 10. And it provided further guidance under each about what to actually write. So it, take, it took it another step further. Next, just note that ChatGPT was first told who. I was very specific. What role must it adopt? I told that, I set that as a parameter before I gave it any other information asking what it should provide. This step is key in helping you gain more favorable responses. And of course, the AI also added some useful advice, which I highlighted in orange below. It suggested, remember to carefully review and follow the specific guidelines provided by the funding organization you are applying to, as some requirements may vary. So it's very conversational and it wished you well at telling you good luck with your grant proposal. So it tries to give a human element. Additionally, within this same chat tab, implementing the line by line style, another prompt 
was added to deepen the originally generated results. So I added a new layer, so to speak, and this was inserted into the grant writing data set. So the image on the right shows the response to the next prompt I entered as it references the previously generated template answer that the AI just provided. ChatGPT laid out what it suggests the actual grant proposal document should contain along with suggested text for what the grant proposal should look like. It even went as far as to give labeled space holders to guide you where you should place content and it suggested what could actually be entered. This is just a small sample of what the AI tool can do overall. It is indeed very powerful, helpful, and very knowledgeable. The earlier warning cannot be overstated, however. It is not a substitute for human expertise, verification, and judgment. It must be remembered that it should be used with caution as it can give inaccurate information, even going as far as making things up. And on this note, I move into some of the limitations of ChatGPT. In the earlier slide, I had pointed out that OpenAI lists some key limitations of using ChatGPT, along with a few examples and a few of its capabilities just to get you started. For this section, in addition to what OpenAI lists on their page, ChatGPT has a few other limitations to note. Firstly, the AI has a maximum length, a text, maximum text length of 3,000 words for responses. But even with this limit, it sometimes times out before the limit is reached when generating a response. You can reprompt it by using the query, did you time out? It will actually apologize and try to pick up where it left off. Or you may just have to regenerate the prompt. AI is also not available in all countries, but of course, this is subject to change over time. The free version is knowledgeable based on internet content only up until September 2021. It doesn't know much about the world beyond September 2021. They have basically reserved that for the paid version, which is for 20 US dollars a month. And it's supposed to offer more accessibility, access to better curated and updated content. So they've kept that piece for the paid version. So you have to understand the data sets limited with the free version. The free version sometimes come on the heavy usage and it becomes unavailable and it runs slowly or the generated responses are incomplete. It may turn out that the paid version is what you need. If you've established the AI's overall value and the use to you for your particular use case. With great power comes great responsibility. For some light reading, I would strongly recommend that you read OpenAI's safety charter. So they have a whole page dedicated to what's the best way, best practices to use chat and their expectations, as well as how they use the model and how they use your data. Because the conversations you do have with chat G GPT are actually recorded. So you have to be careful about using sensitive data. Now that we've explored some of the key limitations, let's look at when it is safe to use ChatGPT. As a researcher, you'll need to access accurate information. Thus, it may very well be that ChatGPT is not the right tool for you to use with your particular research topic. The UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean has created and shared a nice guide on ChatGPT and how to use it. The flowchart image on the right was extracted from this guide, which was sent out in UE's Mona messaging. And it shows a step-by-step -step method to determine if ChatGPT will be safe for you to use for your purposes. So let's quickly go through it. Starting with the yes steps. 
you ask the question, does it matter if the output is true? If the answer to that is yes, then your next question is, do you have the expertise to verify that the output is accurate? If the answer to that is also yes, are you able and willing to take full responsibility, legal, moral, et cetera, for missed inaccuracies? If the answer to that is also yes, then it is possible to use ChatGPT. For the next step, we have no. When we start, if it is that it matters, does it matter if the output is true? If the answer is no, then it is safe to use ChatGPT. And then you have the next part of the process where we'll go through the no steps. So once you start, does it matter if the output is true? If the answer is yes, then your next question is, do you have the expertise to verify that the output is accurate? If your answer to that is no, then the next question is, are you able and willing to take full responsibility, legal, moral, et cetera, for any missed inaccuracies? If the answer to that is also no, then it becomes unsafe to use ChatGPT. So using this chart as a guide, it should save you a lot of time in assessing the practicality of using ChatGPT for your research purposes. Now that we've covered some of the basics on how best to use ChatGPT, let's move on on how to save and share your generated results. ChatGPT by default used to save all your chat conversations on history. This enabled OpenAI to use your conversations content for further model training and improvement. Hence the warning to be careful about entering sensitive or confidential data about anything such as a, you know, from any areas of work or your personal life. However, since April 25th, 2023, so just recently, you now have the ability to turn this feature off. You can do so in the settings option and selecting data controls, using the slider button to disable the feature. Once the feature is off, it does remove your ability to save your conversations and no longer displays them in the history sidebar. But note, OpenAI will still keep your conversations for at least 30 days to monitor abuse, but your data won't be used to help train the AI. This brings me to the conclusion of my presentation. So ChatGPT is indeed a powerful and valuable tool that can aid you in your research. The AI can be used even more broadly than just for research purposes. As I said before, it can help you find errors in grammar for emails, in essays, it can act as a tutor, it can even translate languages. It can also help you write or optimize computer programming code as it will make the suggestions for edits and provide sample answers and the list goes on. The AI is also an evolving tool. There are newer versions of it being offered such as ChatGPT Plus or different versions such as ChatGPT 4. In addition to this, major companies like Microsoft have partnered with OpenAI to offer its use with Bing, with plans to offer plugins in Microsoft 365 applications, while Google, as a competitor, is working assiduously on providing a stronger, more competitive tool. However, in closing, by following the steps outlined in this session, you should have learned the basics on how to successfully use ChatGPT to achieve your research goals. And with practice, you can become proficient in using it to generate high quality responses to your text-based inputs. Thank you for your kind attention. And now I'll hand back over to our moderator. Thank you so much, Nicole McKenzie. That was quite a thorough and informative presentation. Um, I think we have all learned how, the very basics at least, how to start using chat GPT um, prompt engineering and optimization to assist with um, our research uh, endeavors. So now we will hand over to Prof. Lila Rao Graham, who is Professor of Information Systems at the Mona School of Business and Management at the University of the West Indies here at Mona, 
who will be moderating the Q&A session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Francesca, and thank you also to Nicole. I think that was a very informative uh, presentation on how we can get started. Um, I just want to use a little bit of my moderator privilege because I think it's quite important. There is a lot of discussion about ChatGPT um, and what it can do for us, but I think it's also important to note that there are a whole plethora of AI tools out there. And so I, again, I have not used many of these tools, so I want to make that disclaimer, but as I was looking into the possible tools that can be used, as I said, in a few, it didn't take me long to find this, these 15. So there are more and more tools being generated. So we have seen ChatGPT today, which is based on open AI. As Nicole had pointed out, they're coming out with uh, GPT-4 or it's out. I think that one, Nicole, you have to pay for if I'm not mistaken. We also have zero GPT, which may be useful for many of us that are teaching and lecturing because zero GPT is actually developed to detect uh, open AI texts. So in a, in a sense, you can view it as a kind of plagiarism detection for chat GPT content. Uh, Bard is out there. I think that's uh, Google's version of chat GPT. At this time, it's free. I don't know how long that will last. Many of these tools now are free right now, but I think in a very short time, they won't be. Um, so these are just some of the tools. I've used Fireflies, very good for recording and transcribing meetings, but it not just transcribes, but you can also search and analyze the voice conversation. So in a sense, it's voice to text, but more than just transcription. Legally, I don't even know if that's the right pronunciation, but it's for contracts, reviewing contracts. So many of you that are doing grant proposal writing, also there's a, some requirement for some contracts. So it's able to identify gaps in these contracts or missed opportunities and insights. I think Nicole spoke to those that are a uh, chat GPT can improve grammar and your writing, but there are also specific tools AI, AI, AI back tools that are for specific purpose of writing. So the Grammarly is one. And then these are just three of the, yeah, I don't know who I lost my slide. Um, okay, maybe I went the wrong way. Uh, these are three of the tools that I found that are specific for researchers. Consensus is able to extract scientific research. So you won't get all the general articles about that area, but rather the scientific uh, research outputs, journals, and so forth. Again, I have to say that I've never, I haven't used some of these and not all of them are free. I only like to use free tools. So some of them I haven't used. We have SSI for citing and Elicit, which is an actual research assistant. So don't, you don't necessarily just want to focus on chat GPT specifically, but there are specific tools depending on your, as I said, specific needs. So I just wanted to bring home that point because I know chat GPT is what everybody's talking about and everybody's getting excited about, but just be aware there's gonna be more every day we're gonna be seeing uh, new and upgraded tools out there. Okay, so at this point, I think um, Francesca is to uh, get the question and answer going. I did notice uh, one question already in the chat. So you can, Francesca, we can do the chat through the, uh, sorry, the questions through the chat, or, or you could raise your hand and we can ask. They can speak, right, Francesca? Yes, I think we can do the chat first and then we can start um, so, raise hands. Right. Yes. So I saw one question that's, asking about why you have to give that, provide your cell number. I know some of us are a little nervous uh, about chat GPT and how much it's collecting about us. So I think the first question is about why we're providing a cell number as opposed to the email address. And Nicole, I don't know if you want to answer that, but I think it's both, right? Because we have to log in. It asks you what you want to log in using, which account in which you can choose your Google account. 
And then to verify you, it's asking for the cell number. Typically, yes, a correct. cell number is more for security purposes. They can verify you're a real person because you're going to get a code and then you have to enter that code. Typical what banks and other uh, organizations are using for security purposes. As well, they are also able to determine where you are a user from, which country, because chat GPT, I think, is not available in all countries. Is that, am I right, Nicole? Yes, that's correct. It's not available in all countries. They're, they're, okay. they're um, an open AI. They speak to the fact that over time, they will change this. Okay. Um, here I see a question from Tracy Evans Gilbert. Um, I think it says, if a group has a similar assignment, can the chat GPT formulate a rubber stamp output? I'm not quite sure, Tracy, you want to, uh, Nicole, do you, are you clear about the question? Uh, it just seems a little bit roundabout because I'm not sure what she means by rubber stamp, but if I was supposed to assume template, uh, it, it can create a template um, that can be used uh, to be able to set up the assignment, but I'm not sure Chase I would have to speak I think what mm -hmm. I think what she's trying to ask is if um the students have a, the same assignment, if they will all give the same results if they put it into chat GPT. And I think what I would say to that, if that is what you're asking, is that it depends on the prompt. Yeah, put in and the, the context, GPT right? That will give them the output. So they may not have the same response. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Because how, I, how I, I showed you earlier is that how you do your prompt optimization or your prompt engineering, that will set context and it will give you absolutely different answers. But yes, a similar assignment, literally because of how you wrote it. You wrote it in a much more intelligent style, giving it more specific details, and that will help to get the most out of it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I've tried both BARD and ChatGPT in terms of how to ask and what's asked, and you will find you might get different um, results using both. So you can experiment if you're interested in ChatGPT versus BARD. BARD, as I know it, is, as Nicole said, ChatGPT has used document, their corpus is up to 2021. Uh, I think BARD is using real time, so they're using more current. Um, but again, as Nicole says, chat G, uh, GPT-4 is also probably going to use current, uh, more current documents also. So it's, it, it, the how you prompt is the key. And also, as I said, different versions may give you different results. And you have to remember the limitations. It's a 3,000 text-based limit. That's it. So you, it cannot write the entire proposal for you at, at no point, especially because it's a free version. So that, that's an expectation nobody should have. It's really just going to give you a nice little summary, point you in the right direction, and basically just inspire you. But if you do need the short things that are within that 3000 based input, you can actually get it to write the entire thing for you. I see another question in the chat. Uh, Rajni Reynolds, does chat GPT use Boolean operators such as and, or, and not? Nicole, do you want to take that or? Well, it's a natural language processing model. So happily, you can do exactly that. Um, it's very intelligent. As I said, it can help to write programming code. So yes, it will. if it if it, it actually is confused, it will ask you to give further clarity. Um, so yeah. it, will, it, will, it will actually prompt you to be more specific. So yes. And I think that's, that's, I think that's the real distinction between these newer chat GPT is the type of language, natural language processing has always been quite difficult for computers to manage. Yes. And so this has really gained this attention because the natural way in which you can uh, interface with, yes. with it as a technology, that's really what's, what's made it. So much more valuable, right? Yes. 
you know, and seems intelligent because the fact that if you sent it, you gave it those prompts with the Boolean questions and you know, it's kind of literally would let you know it's kind of confused. Can you be more specific type of thing, which is good because it then gets you to think about how to ask the right questions and make the right statements and help it to understand what topic or what exactly are you trying, what kind of data are you trying to extract from it? Okay, thanks, Nicole. I see this here, I hope it's right, is asking what percentage of AI detection is considered plagiarism? Boy, I think that's an ongoing question. <laughs> it's a TBD to be decided. <laughs> But there are tools out there that um, I remember I was reading something about MIT. They had uh, a young coder had created a page that um, a tool that can actually you can enter your essay in and it can tell it's supposed to be able to detect if if AI wrote the, the essay. So, you know, but of course, those things will have to evolve because the AI is actually being trained. It's getting better. So it, it the really their aim is to make it be blurry. That's the funny thing. The company's aim is to make, you shouldn't be able to figure it out. I mean, I, that's the goal I see that they seem to be going after, especially Google as a competitor. So in the end, it, it may be tricky. We are going into uncharted territory. Yeah, and I think Julian's uh, uh, question is related because he's pointing out uh, when a researcher uses chat GPT to assist in writing a literature review and includes the findings in an article, uh, whose intellectual work is it? So in a sense, how do you cite chat GPT? It's even more interesting because one of the criticisms of chat GPT is that that corpus that it's using to build its responses, uh, they themselves do not cite uh, whose work. So it's hard to verify when you get uh, an a answer from chat GPT because it doesn't provide the citations, at least in the free version, it's difficult to really go back to the source or find the sources to really uh, verify that. So in a sense, it's more of an ethical thing, I think right now, in the sense that a lot of persons that produce, whether art, uh, chat GPT can write poetry, create art. It can, uh, the first year computing, it can write the co computer code for almost all, I think all their assignments. So, most persons, when they uh, use ChatGP to produce output, uh, would say that they this was generated from ChatGPT. But nowadays, we're seeing some ethical issues arising about persons producing output from ChatGPT without um, acknowledging that. So it is, I think, an important question, Julian, that you're asking. And again, these are some of the things that will have to be sorted out. One of the problems I would say, not problems, but one of the interesting things about chat GPT is the speed at which it's become pervasive. I think chat GPT reached 1 million users in five days. Um, mm -hmm. Twitter took, I think Twitter took two years to get there. Instagram, two and a half months, three months. So as at, we're trying to sort some of these things out as, um, as the technology is spreading. Quite oh, I wanted to point something out that it actually can do the citation in a little. It's how you prompt it. So I, if I mean, I can share my slide um, that shows exactly with the prompt. You tell it to cite the sources. You tell it to justify the reason why it chose a particular article. Um, and but when I did the prompt um, engineering, I said use it a special year. So I said 2006 to 2019, you can actually get it to cite, but it won't do it in a general question. You must tell it. Once you give it those instructions, it will go out and do its best to give you the sources. Um, and as detailed as you are, if you want it from a particular author, um, a particular subset of data, from a particular archive, once that was an inter internet-based thing, it will actually go out and try it and try to get it. And I think Desia makes a point, it's very important that some of the references may not, uh, remember, this is a, uh, uh, you a must generator, fact check, right? Generator. You can make it up. <laughs> so when you get those citations, you need to go back to verify those are real citations. In some exactly. cases, the citation actually does not exist. Exactly. You have to be very careful how you use very, very careful. Uh, citations. 
Um, okay, so we have a hand up, Patrice Whiteley. You, I see your hand up because I don't see any more questions in the window itself. I'm not hearing you if you're asking the question. I'm not hearing is, oh, uh, she's not able to unmute. Can we unmute her? Oh, okay. Thank you. you <laughs> All right. Sorry um, no problem. Nicole, I'm so glad you just repeated that statement because that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about when you said that it can make things up. Because if its responses are based on data that it has access to, how exactly is it making things up? What do you mean by that? Because it's not a conscious being, right? So what is it doing when it's making things up? Well, I can't explain the exact how. I, I would be remiss to tell you that I could explain how. But what it is is that when you fact check the name of the article, it doesn't exist. You're like, where is it? You know, never, so, you can't, if you if it if it didn't tell you exactly what archive or where it went to get that information, and when you try and do a search in Google, or you um, try to use something like the Internet Archive or some other verification process, and you cannot find the article. Then that's what I mean by it made it up, because so Dr. Whiteley, I, it's it's using AI techniques, so it's actually yeah, yeah. generating that text. It's not extracting yeah. the text from the various sources. So it uses some kind of probabilistic, um, yes, different algorithms, but like a probabilistic algorithm that would say, okay, these words occur together. So yeah. when the person writing I these words, then these are the other words that are likely. So it's actually that particular answer you're getting doesn't exist anywhere in any document. It's not like it's extracting a sentence from each document. It's actually generating that text based on AI algorithms and models, uh, quite sophisticated. Um, so that's a, a real distinction between like a search engine. A search engine, you're really saying, find me articles and links to things that are related to this area. Uh, the chat yeah. GPT and these newer techniques, they're actually generating it using, as I said, different AI modeling. So they're, they're predicting the likelihood of these words coexisting, for example, and used right. together because they have this huge corpus of documents that they've learned from. So it's quite sophisticated, but as I said, it's it, that's why it's difficult to cite because it's actually generating. So it's actually generating a citation. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. I don't know if I'm missing anyone. I like to see this as uh, you very extremely useful for a first draft. Think of it as a kind of productivity tool. If you're writing a grant proposal, for example, here's a productivity tool. You're not rather than starting from scratch, it's generated through one of these tools. And then the expert will still have to exist because everybody's talking a lot about it's replacing experts and we won't have jobs and all of those uh, issues. But the expert, for, remember, it's, it can be making up stuff. Uh, and so you really need the expert that will then go through that document to ensure the validity and, and consistency of, of what is in that document. So I view it as a productivity tool. It can significantly count down that generation of that first draft, but then uh, you still need that expert to ensure uh, the, the quality of these documents. Yes, so I, I, I personally don't see the, the replacing humans right now. We still need those experts, as I said, um, in speaking to industry, they could say some of their client proposals, it takes them 40% less time. Because as I said, that first draft is usually what is the most tedious, but you can get the first draft. And then, as I said, uh, you can then spend your time in perfecting that per first draft.
Okay, Francesca, I don't see any other questions. All right, colleagues, if there are, okay, I think there's one more. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think my, people are, are thinking and, and, and asking. So I think there's one more from Pat North Oval. Right. The, so the, I think Pat's question is one that definitely will have to have, uh, it was going to transform education because obviously if we can do it, then our students are doing, can be doing it also. So I think it's how we have to be innovating innovative in how to use uh we expect students are going to use these tools in my opinion so rather than them blocking it necessarily see how we can be innovative in terms of using these tools so for example we've seen the cases where you could give a student the same uh, essay topic generate it through uh chat gpt have students write it and then compare the two and of course, it's going to make us have to be, the recall is where it's going to be, chat GPT is going to be very, very good at. As I said, I know computing has to be looking at this because every first year assignment coding, chat GPT can generate. So it is going to have to, we have to transform the way we're going to assess, uh, as, as Heather says, we have to be innovative in assessments and see how best uh, we can infuse these technologies. Yes, definitely. Um, thank you so much, colleagues, for coming on to our grant writing seminar for 2023, um, Chat GPT and Research. We hope that you guys, you have um, gotten some, some interesting information and it has sparked ideas and you will take away with it um, and go and research and see if this is something and AI assistance, if if, if it's something that could assist with your um, research endeavors um, for now and moving forward. Um, if there isn't anything else, everyone have a good rest of the day.